Folks, here we are once again with you here on the Squeaky Wheel. With me as always is my very good friend and the co-host, the President, Lawrence Gervais. Broadcasting here, as I've mentioned many a time before, from the south of Red Deer, north of the United States. We are in the beautiful area of close to Calgary, Alberta. And Lawrence, every week we get a chance to have a conversation. And you and I, it is from a conversation from a Métis perspective. You and I both being with a Métis background and a neat history, as we've talked about many times before, of our families having this, this connection. Our fathers, the, my, my, the, the whole Saskatchewan, the musicianship, you know, you and I both got guitars that are hanging behind us. Lawrence, we got a lot of things to talk about today. Folks, I'm Ross Memphis Pambrin of the Memphis Group. We do environmental monitoring and I'm very fortunate that I get to share my conversation with somebody as knowledgeable and as connectable as Lawrence Gervais. So Lawrence, you know, we have a number of things you and I need to talk about today. We're going to jump on to the fact that, and we talked about this a little bit, that the Pope is coming and or our group is going. We want to talk treaties. We need to talk a bit about Two-Spirit. I want to talk some of the music things that are happening because it's a challenging time as we move forward. A little bit about the world of um, our actors in the world, some of the challenges that people have faced. Um, as usual, folks, I'm doing everything in my power and Lawrence and I, and I think we both appreciate our time to have a conversation about the scams that are happening out there and how we can try and protect our communities. And <laughs> this is a rare one. We're actually going to throw a little bit of Netflix in there. So Lawrence, thank you. Welcome folks to the show. You can always reach out to us. Start us out, Lawrence. Let's talk a little bit about the Métis community and what's happening in the world of religion. Yeah, I mean, when you said actors, I thought, well, you know, aren't we all actors and the world's a stage, you know? It was like- <laughs> Stop it. Some Shakespeare quote, but yeah. yeah. Um, no, uh, you know, in the Métis Nation, you know, community right now, there's, you know, certainly a lot of constitution talks. We're still having those across the province. But one of the big things that's happening is this uh, uh, papal visit. So we have a delegation that's going from, uh, you know, uh, Métis National Council, I believe there's six delegates and we have two uh Gary Ganyan up in region 4 as well as um Angie Creer who's you know sort of a provincial elder and she's you know an elder that works in the friendship centers too so and a residential school survivor so that was kind of the pick but I you know I did have a meeting with uh Bishop McGratton uh we did talk about um working you know cuz we have a we house a Métis historian down here in region 3 I think we're the only region that's currently doing that but uh you know we're gonna certainly lend him out to their archivist in the in the diocese to look at some of the records that they have and sharing as much uh, data or knowledge as they can and uh, we're really really grateful for calgary diocese to actually do that and look at the parishes and and see what we uncover but uh, yeah we look forward to that work and how it's going to go but you know, you know, uh, a lot of indigenous leaders, First Nation chiefs, and, and us are are certainly looking at an apology because that's important. If uh, the Pope decides to come to Canada, and uh, where does he go? Well, hopefully he goes to Lac Saint Anne because that's certainly a, a good starting point, especially here in Alberta. Um, and if anybody doesn't know, that's uh, sort of an indigenous-led uh, church. Thing and and Lac Saint Anne does have some some healing qualities to that giant lake, up near I I believe it's Saint Albert, so you know east of Edmonton and and you know we look forward to um you know if he does decide to attend Alberta to maybe go there so you know it, that I think that's fabulous that you brought that up and you know one of the reasons why I bring it up is um, I grew up in Saint Albert now as you know I was born in Germany and I lived all over but Saint Albert was a place that I spent a lot of time and I and I have some familiarity with Lac Saint Anne but yet it's I I find I enjoy this part of our conversation in the sense that we are learning our heritage and the idea of the challenge that has been presented to our seniors to our age uh, to the awareness of our youth Catholicism, Christianity, this has been somewhat entrenched in our culture for a long time. Mm -hmm. And and I've made this comment before, Lawrence, that the the our community, 
these and our elders who who were staunchly raised Catholic, and all of a sudden these awareness of residential schools to the extent that we are all learning of the colonial challenge, the colonial, this was not, hey, come on over. This was, this is the way it's going to be. And you will learn, or you will have the savagery beat out of you. And I think that's important. And I, a long, long time ago, I may have made this comment before that when I met B.B. King, I struggled for a month trying to think of what I was going to ask that man. And in the end, one of the questions I wanted to ask him was, this was a lot of years ago, what was it like to meet as many popes as he had? And I think he had probably met three, three of the popes. And it, and that was a, it was an interesting question that I wanted to ask. Now, in the end, when I did meet the gentleman, Mr. B.B. King, I forgot to ask the question, but the fact that we're sending a delegation to talk to an individual who spiritually represents a, a, a uh, an endless population of spiritual individuals. Wow. Again, I only wanted to ask a question of somebody who had met the Pope. We're sending a delegation. And I, Lawrence, you know, you and I talk about this all the time. I think it's important that the church acknowledges and acknowledges is one thing. I'm curious as to how they are going to provide an apology or an answer. Yeah. Um, you know, and certainly when the truth, you know, is being uncovered, you know, month by month as we go along here, the church has to have um, a reaction to those truths that are coming out. And that's a part of reconciliation. You can't have reconciliation um, after, you know, before the truth comes. You have to do it usually after because that's the uncovering, right? So, you know, these burial sites over this last year have really pushed this, you know, process to happen. And, you know, are we glad? Are we uncertain? For sure. You know, and, and that's what we have to, to look at. But it is a start. And if yeah. it's a start in the right direction, then fantastic. But if, you know, we come out of this and, you know, certainly the Roman Catholic Church decides, well, we're not going to issue an apology, even though the bishops in Canada already did. Um you know, certainly it's really up to the Pope and his followers, right, to to kind yeah. of see this through. And, and you know, us, we, we have to be ready because if he does do that, well, then there's going to be action as a result too. So, you know, I'm glad that we have this this discussion with the, you know, Archbishop and the bishops already, and, and we're going to speak to them. And, and hopefully that gets to the Cardinal here in Canada and, and he goes on to the Pope, right? So that's, you know, what we're process we're looking at. But, you know, there was atrocities, there was genocide, there was all these things that did happen. Um, but then there was also sickness that happened with these kids. And the more yeah. information that we have as a community, then we can certainly let those families rest, right? I, I tease you a lot. I, I mean, again, I tease you about the fact that your doors and your phone is always available. I tease you about the fact of, you know, our relationship and such. But I also, again, have to say thank you. Again, you are... Um, the person who is part of the conversation at a regional level, the representative for our associate, for our, our, for our citizenship, for this conversation. And again, I do know you are meeting with the, 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 the archdiocese, the relationships that are bringing the conversation from region three, from your representative role, again, Rupert's land and such like that. You're bringing that conversation forward. So Lawrence, Again, I, I joke about the fact that I was going to get a chance to talk to B.B. King just to ask him a question. You're part of that. And I, you know, Lawrence, I, I, again, I'd like to throw out some more barbs at you because that's just what I love to do. But thank you. This is the, this is a unique time. The, 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 the COVID is a unique time. The pandemic is a unique time. But at the same time that all this is happening, we are seeing a spiritual awakening of our culture. We're seeing the awareness. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit, and I know I'm still learning, as and I as I make uh, mention to all of our guests every time, I am still learning. I, I'd like to ask you a little bit about treaties, and here's something that I've struggled with. I'm reading a little bit more about Two-Spirit, and each time I think I have a better understanding 
Lawrence, you know, again, you engage these communities in a lot of different ways. Can you open up the dialogue a little bit here? Um, you know, I think, you know, from what I, what I've seen and what I've witnessed, you know, cause I've been, you know, having, I would say, you know, in front of a community for quite a number of years now, at least since 1999. And I've sat through ceremony, you know, through two spirited people and, you know, they certainly, you know, have an, that, um, that knowledge and that ceremony that brought them to that word, that word two spirited. And mm-hmm. maybe there's other names for, you know, for every nation. But you know they, you know they do, do talk about having a female and a male spirit, right? And that's what makes them a two spirited person. But then there's also some, you know, uh, I would say les- lesbian, gay individuals, and and those ones who identify as that, but don't identify with two spirited too. So um, I think it's more of a ceremonial thing, from what okay. I understand. But yeah, and and culturally, is it is it. And and maybe you can, you know, have you heard, is it a relationship between um, what we would consider the, you know, traditional white culture and the awareness and recognition of indigenous culture? Or is it, is it more, as you're pointing out, is there the other aspect? In which case, again, I, neither of us are experts at this. And folks, I just want you all to be aware the idea that when I get to ask a question to Lawrence or Lawrence asks a question to me when it comes to things, we are trying to be respectful and aware of the conversation. And mm-hmm. if you have those questions, folks, make sure you email us, tsw at the squeakywheel.ca and bring that awareness to us. Where we get a lot of this conversation is because people bring this to us and we want to ask so that we have a better understanding. We're not the experts, um, but we want to be a part of that conversation. Yeah. And, you know, I'm respectful of, you know, what, you know, indigenous people come up with, you know, this is, if it goes through ceremony and it goes through the right protocol and, and all those, those things. And, you know, that it's one certainly group that's, you know, um, but we have to respect, and this is the name that they come up with. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for that because that's certainly valid and that's, that's who they are. Right. And that's, that's the the terms that they use. Um, And I think it's great. And, you know, the, you know, I, I haven't sat through those ceremonies, so I don't really know about the female male um, teachings or anything like that. Sure. But I know that that's a you know, prime derivative of, you know, who they are. And identity is so, so big with us right now. You know, we've been trying to reestablish our identity, both in First Nations and Métis communities for a long time now. The Indian, not so much because there wasn't, you know, a lot of contact as much as there was to us. So mm. we're still on it. We're still trying to have a resurgence, a an ident- identity resurgence, you know, almost right. So, you know, and from what I know, there are uh, there is a um, a gay and lesbian um, and bisexual, you know, LGBTQT and yeah, plus all of them, yeah, um, Métis local in Manitoba currently, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, we open that door as a Métis Nation community that if they feel that they're underrepresented to to look at them representing themselves. And that's who we are. That's a good thing about the Métis Nation. We have that door wide open. And I think that's important. Again, um, not about us without us. We're not necessarily trying to represent any of these different groups. We mm-hmm. are simply saying, folks, these groups exist. Acknowledge them. And if you wish to be more involved in the conversation, participate. That, to me, is the fact that we are bringing the awareness to this conversation. And for yeah. all of our listeners out there, you know, uh, who who don't watch the video, but now just listen to our podcast. Yeah, Lawrence and I are as doofusy and fun as you could get. And though we, I think, you know, generously in, in the background of the video that, that you may or may not be watching, there's representation about the 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 relationship Lawrence and I have had on our own personal journeys like Lawrence I often make the comment you have a you know your beautiful ballet picture because you have a lot of history of of your study and time working in the world of ballet I have we both have guitars you know I have my business behind me and and I think it's important that we are not trying to misrepresent who we are we are just simply trying to open up that conversation so that everybody has a voice yeah, I mean, you know, us as a Métis person, you know, we we certainly get um, characterized in certain ways, like jigging and musicians and, you know, farmers and rodeo people and, <laughs> and yeah. you know, 
up to business people, right? And, you know, we all relate to all those things. And people call us bridge people because we can certainly be very comfortable in, you know, a certain, uh, like a ceremony First Nations environment and be very comfortable in a very corporate structure at the same time, right? So, I mean, the Métis community, they're they're going through an identity um, crisis. And, you know, we, we certainly want to be supportive of everybody as much as possible and keep those doors open and, you know, have, you know, very good dialogue. Um, if people don't feel that I represent a certain a category of people, well, then they should certainly uh, give me a call and send me an email and we sit down and we talk about it and, and certainly like that. But I've never had a, a call in the last six years about me not representing people well. So, Oh, no doubt. Let, let's throw in the idea of treaty, Lawrence. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, this is something that happens to us all the time. As much as, as I, as I joke, or you make that comment, how many people come up to me and say, well, you must love Pemmican. Folks, I don't eat as much pemmican as you <laughs> think I do. In fact, I don't know. I, there's probably a chance that I've tried it once, but you know, we have this identity issue. And let's talk a little bit about that where people go, wow, because you're Métis, you must have some complete awareness of treaties. Well, I mean, we kind of and sort of do. We have, we have awareness of agreements with Canada and, and the yeah. Crown. But did we call them treaties? Well, no. And in fact... There's only been one adhesion to a treaty in, you know, number three, I think, in Ontario. And, and you know, certainly Canada and the Crown certainly ignored that, that adhesion too. So um, when people say, you know, we are all treaty people, I kind of get it. What they're trying to do is certainly acknowledge the land and this is Treaty 7 and, and we need to be respectful of that, in which we are. But <clears throat> in a sense, you know, when Canada went to war with the Métis, you know, our ancestors fought against becoming a part of their system, you know, and wh- where's the answer to that? Because we were fighting against becoming a part of the Indian Act or treaties or or we wanted to be on our own and have our own agreements and the stuff that Riel and Dumont and all these people fought for, right, including my ancestors who passed away. So, you know, I had to be very respectful of that. And, and I honor the treaty because this is Treaty 7. Certainly, yeah. I understand that, but I, I don't think I would call myself a treaty person. And on our program, we acknowledge uh, the relationship. And that's that's ultimately what it is. And as we have new generations, we're ultimately, you know, expanding that relationship. But at the end of the day, we're, you know, I think politely, we are saying when we go back to the land, this is this is part of that time that we where you know, where the conversation, where the relationship started and but let's also continue to move forward. Yeah. And also, so, you know, people are aware and the viewers are aware when we get our registration and our citizenship for being Métis, we have to sign a form and have a commissioner of all sign it that we make a declaration that we're not on the treaties, treaty role, right? And, and yeah. our list, our name is not on their list. So uh, I don't know, you know, I know, I understand where the, you know, that term is kind of coming from and it's a, certainly a a good term and we should be thoughtful of the treaty, but Métis folks really aren't. Oh, Lawrence, you can see by the light behind me. Uh, Folks, for all those of you who are just listening in, the bright red shiny light is spinning just like the old time police, uh, I think they call it a cherry on the top of the cop car. This is that time (laughs) that I've told all of our listeners, as well as Lars, this is when I bring in the conversation. Okay, I'm going to turn that off just because it's too bright. The the conversation about scams. So we're at that time of the program. We're going to get back to the whole bunch of the other things. But one of the ones, Lawrence, that I wanted to bring up, and again, I've made this comment before, this is simply awareness for both our youth, both everybody my age, Lawrence, you're much older age, and then the elders. Folks, um, Lawrence, and, and I'm going to bounce this by you because I'm curious as to how many times you received a phone call this week. But this one of the recent scams that we were getting was, and it doesn't matter what they start the conversation with, but this one was a robocall essentially, and it said, we, your credit card, this is all it said, didn't even say the name, your credit card company, has identified that you have made some purchases and there are some suspicious purchases, including one from eBay. Folks, everybody, 
and my wife included, and every family member I know has made a purchase uh, with their credit card online. That's easy. That's the hook. The next hook is they say, uh, you may you may or may not have made one from eBay. Well, 50% of us haven't, 50% of us have. So that's the second hook. Well, I didn't, but somebody claims they are having used my credit card. Now, on this, on this scam, if you want to listen to your, um, let's say the, the questionable purchases, again, folks, they don't even know if you've made these purchases. Press two. Soon as you press that button, you open up and you go down the rabbit hole of where you have acknowledged you are a person on the other end of the line. Somebody will come on and say, yeah, there's been some questionable action on your credit card. They won't even say which one. They may or may not know. But in your head, you're already thinking, oh, well, I may or may not have made a card. I don't want to get hooked on the hook for any purchases. And these purchases are generally at a price point where it causes some suspicion. Folks, hang up. Hang up. Lawrence, when you get those numbers, do you even answer them? Um, yeah, no, just kidding. I, I wouldn't answer that. <laughs> and I don't answer anything on phone because, you know, these government agencies or credit card companies, they use paper still. Yes. You know? And if they're not sending you a statement that you can log into, well, then no, then don't accept it. Don't accept an email. Don't accept the phone call. Yes. Right? They, if they want to get in touch with you. If they call you, and I'm not saying that this doesn't happen. I have been called by my credit card agency. Somebody is on the phone and I say, well, I find this very confusing. And they, and if you ask them, I am going to hang up and I am going to call the number on the back of the credit card that you have supplied. This individual will say, thank you, go ahead. But when they're doing robo calls, folks, I'm going to click this light again. When it's just a robocall, that is a scam. Do not answer. And if it's not a phone number you know, they will leave a message. And if they leave a message, call the number on the back of the card if you have any concerns. Lawrence, let's move on. Um, Omicron. Yep. Now, you know, it's very close to Optimus Prime. Right. Which... You know, I from growing up, and I'm sure I don't know if you played with um, what were those guys called? Transformers. <laughs> yeah. Though <laughs> those Transformers were relatively, in a way, fun. The Omnicron. What do you think? I don't really know too much about. It. I mean, other than it's it's just like Delta. It was it's going from yeah. one country to the next right now. What's going to happen? You know, nobody really knows yet. Nobody so knows. It could be a dud. Or it, it could, could be, be done. I'm not suggesting yeah. that, you know, there's some conversation that, hey, we're, we're concerned, but I'm not, you know, uh, fortunate and, and Lord knows folks, we're both vaccinated here. We're not anti-vaxxers, but the, we need to learn more. And I mean, yeah. the world is shutting down quite hard. So obviously there's some cur concern out there, but folks continue to do your part. There's not much else you can do than do your part. And, yeah. and when our, Agencies continue to ask you to wear your mask, wear your mask. How hard is it? Right. So. Yeah, I know. Um, and, you know, we've had this discussion many times over the 60 episodes and, you know, this is number 60. Just so everybody's this is aware. 60. Yeah. yeah. And this whole podcast started out of COVID, right. To yeah. certainly get to our members, get information to them, you know, and at a crucial time at home. Um, yeah. but you know, you know, we've, we've had, you know, an mRNA expert here before the vaccine was even unleashed to talk about the technology. Um, but we all know we're all very mm -hmm. conscious and, you know, that masks and vaccines are helping the pandemic It's keeping the numbers low. It's keeping, you know, real strong issues out of the hospital. And that's what we have to think about. And if Omicron certainly manage itself away from those vaccines and it's not working well then we have a serious issue yeah and and this is hey we're all contending with this folks don't think that the rest of the world isn't contending with this this mm -hmm. is exactly what happens lawrence we got a few more minutes i wanted to hit on a couple of things like okay alec baldwin 
you know, all of a sudden he's in, in more in the media and we're all, I think the world is pretty much familiar with the rust shooting and the, and the tragic loss of that director. The, now they're saying, well, he never really pulled the trigger. It was a misfire. Right. You know, it's been a long history of awareness that guns don't kill people. People kill people. And I don't want to get into the argument of both and the semantics of whether or not this is true, but if how did this thing just go off in his hand? I, I have no idea. I mean, if you have a faulty trigger on a gun and you're managing that gun, you'd probably know about it. You, you know, so so is this just lawyers? Certainly. I mean, they'll try to figure out a way. I mean, that they lawyer up and lawyers kind of yeah. have their own interpretation of of what they what they can pr you know prove, and certainly that's in any court, right? So. Yeah. I mean, if he's saying that he's not responsible, well, you know, I don't, I'm not sure the courts really like that if they can prove otherwise, right? That's true. Maybe that's a lot of what this falls down to is just responsibility. Absolutely. And they want to assign some level. And this is, this, these ploys are simply one more reason to say, well, let's drop my responsibility percentage a little bit because, yeah, that just misfire and it just went off. And it, maybe that's, Sadly, but if you go if you go loss. to a certain neighborhood or or somewhere else when you know there's a gun a faulty gun that goes off and it kills somebody what happens to that person you know it's good point because you're a star of a, a Hollywood yeah. film do you get any leeway there like it yeah you know and I think that's what they're trying to certainly do is protect Alec Baldwin's interest but he's yeah. you know I think the best thing he can do is just admit it and and you know stand up to the judge and. And do that, and that's it. Well, there's an ethical and a moral thing there. Like my my pen just went off, Lawrence. <laughs> so I got to stop writing things down. The um, Blue Rodeo's got a new album out, and I was watching an interview with Jim Cuddy, and I absolutely love Blue Rodeo. Who does Who doesn't love those Canadian icons? Uh, I I had a chance to meet Greg Heeler, although that's got to be 30 years ago when they were early in the inception of Blue Rodeo. And they have carried that music on forever. And it sounds like this recent album, they, they, Jim Cuddy and Jim, uh, Greg Keeler weren't even in the same room together. They were just putting the tracks together over COVID. I don't think anybody's in the same room anymore. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you, know, I played you and softball. I were, but <laughs> yeah, I played softball with Blue Rodeo once, right? A, a few times in Toronto and nice guys, you know, very yeah. personable. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I find it very interesting to, to hear that they're still going on, you know, yeah. they, I mean, they're a little bit older than I am or we are. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think even Greg Geeler's deaf, like he's had such bad injury folks. If any of you are out there who know the fellas and you could provide an opportunity for Lawrence and I to play hockey with Greg <laughs> Keeler during one of those where they do their hockey thing, folks, you're hearing it here on the squeaky wheel. Try and get us in there. Um, the last couple of minutes, Lawrence, I wanted to throw out the idea of you watching the Yellowstone. Yes. Oh, I knew this was going to happen. The, I, you know, you're not the first person to say, Ross, are you watching Netflix? Are you watching Yellowstone? And of course, folks, just like anybody, this is one of those, those conversations that gets to the point now of, Hey, how about that weather out there? Hey, what are you watching on Netflix? I think I need to watch it, Lawrence. Give me well, your- Well, if you try to find it on Netflix, you're not, because it's on Amazon oh, Prime. Oh, there but, it is. Yeah. But anyways, you know, if, you know, what I'm finding is that, geez, you know, we have a lot of family and I have a lot of family that identify yeah. as cowboys and and we had the, the recent passing of Davy Shields Sr. And, and certainly, you know, we want to acknowledge Shirley Shields. But when I was talking to her, because they already work in movies, um, you know, they're they're kind of saying, oh, Dave loved Yellowstone. Right. And I can kind of see why, because he was a, a tough cowboy. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. He and that guy rode a lot of bronc. So. Yeah. But I mean, you know, and I think that's what that show appeals a lot to is that cowboy identity, because I think more and more you watch it every episode, you kind of go, oh, I identify with that guy. And hey, he's pretty cool. I want to work. I want to put on a cowboy hat. I want to grow a beard. I want to, you know, get out with the well. horses and stuff. So. I, I watched this, uh, this, it was like a 20 second meme, a video meme. And it was season one of Yellowstone. And you see this, this guy walk in just wearing a t-shirt and a, and a pair of jeans. And he says to his wife, Hey, it's time for Yellowstone. And the next 
season he walks in he's wearing a ball cap he's got sunglasses on in the, in the representation to the third season he walks in and he's got a cowboy hat and he's got these sunglasses on and in the fourth chapter yeah he walks in wearing a jean jacket sunglasses cowboy hat jeans and he's like Yellowstone time. So obviously <laughs> the characterization has led to this guy by watching Yellowstone, just like you said, your family or these people who have really toughened up. Well, you know, it's funny because Kevin Costner did so well up until they made Waterworld and then his career oh. went down the tubes. And then they come up with this show and you're like, oh, I love Kevin Costner now all of a sudden. He's right? back so, on top. Yeah. Hey, yeah. he was always in all the sports movies that everybody loved, right? He was yeah. in- in, in all of the shows that, and he had so much success. And yet, yes, Waterworld. Oh, folks, if there's one movie you just never want to watch, it's that. Yeah, those romantic movies. Yeah, too. So this one, he doesn't <laughs> know rom romance about this John Dutton guy at all. So hey, you might have been the ballet dancer, but I sure do love all of his romance movies. I can't, <laughs> I, I got to admit, I loved The Draft. It was fabulous. He's done, that man has done so many good shows. So, Lawrence, that's our time. Um, folks, we again, you know, it's always a unique challenge with everything that's happening in the world. Some of our guests, when we're trying to get them to jump on our show, thank you for jumping onto our podcast. You're going to find us now on iTunes and Spotify. Make sure you send out your emails to us, tsw at the squeakywheel.ca. Watch for the drop downs at the end. Thank you for listening to our land acknowledgement at the end. Lawrence, I can't say thank you enough. Folks, you can find us on www.thesqueakywheel.ca. Lawrence and I love bringing this attention to to the conversation every week lawrence close us out yeah i want to thank everybody for listening this this uh this week and you know we look forward to the conversation um you know we look forward to maybe a christmas episode in the future uh -huh. um and look to hopefully get back to sitting in the same room um oh. hopefully we get there lawrence we're going to get there we've got all of the gear from our tell us stuff from our from our kitchen party we're going to get there so folks from all of us here at the squeaky wheel we can't say thank you enough make sure you click the subscribe button follow us on facebook instagram wherever you can thank you for sharing the conversation and keep the wheel squeaking the squeaky wheel is brought to you by the squeaky wheel company co-hosted by the president lawrence gervais from MA region 3 and the captain ross memphis pamper our program is broadcast from calgary in region 3 of the metis nation of alberta which is part of the historic metis nation homeland we also acknowledge these lands are the traditional territories of Treaty 7, the Black Book Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Gani, Lutsina, and Stony Nakoda, whom we share this land on the basis of our historical and ongoing relationships. You can always reach us for comment about our programming by email at tsw at thesqueakywheel.ca or find us on our website, www.squeakywheel.ca and our socials. For our comments, it is our focus to recognize all of our First Nations and Indigenous friends, share a connection with Métis settlements, and listen to and show respect to our Métis brothers and sisters and families. Here at the Squeaky Wheel, we give thanks to our elders for their guidance and to Mother Earth for her time she allows us to be here and share her bounty. From all of us at the Squeaky Wheel, Danzei.